We're here for the Inquisition. Um, I, I realized a little while ago that um, no one has really done a, a serious uh, interview, really, with uh, this great man, who I think is a, a national treasure as far as jazz is concerned, because he's done so much and he's contributed so much in many, many ways to the music and helped to propagate it, keep it going, whether it be playing, writing about it, broadcasting about it, directing programs about it. He's been involved uh, since the days of the trad boom. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Poynton. I'll start with Dipper now, then, and play that in. There we are. That's a little bit of an introduction to uh, some of the music that inspired Mike in his early days. But before we get into the music, where were you born, Mike? Born in North London. Now, the, the same year as Pearl Harbor. You can work that out for yourself. <laughs> Lovely girl. Uh, and and did you hear much music when you were growing up? Well, I was very lucky because my parents had a gramophone and played 78s, and I, I used to listen to those and... Uh, that was, I suppose, my first musical experiences. And my Uncle Vin, and my cousin Leslie is here to prove it, he came back from the RAF and had a George Formby record. So that was quite good to hear at that time, too. <laughs> Splendid. Do you, what was the, what, do you remember which record it was? I do. It was um, uh, Frigidaire Fanny. Oh, that will do. There's <laughs> a title for you. There's a title for you. So what led you to jazz? Well, um... The school I went to had a music society, like a lot of them did. 
And I'd been having a few piano lessons at the time because my mother, mother played piano and although she was self-taught, and perhaps because she was, she said to me, you must have some lessons. And she got a piano and I tried to learn it. But then in the school music society, there were some jazz records and I thought, I like this. Uh, one of them was Humphrey Littleton, one yeah. was Graham Bell, both of whom I got to know many years later. But the interesting thing, the watershed, you might say, is one of my fellow pupils, he said his brother was in the RAF and had left a collection at home. Would I like to come and hear some of these records? And I did, and uh, there were some New Orleans sides there. And just before I listened to those, I'd seen the Ken Collier Band live at my local concert <laughs> hall in Croydon, because although I was born in North London, I grew up around South London, and I thought, this is raw. This is inspired music. I like the feel of that. So I tried to trace back where it came from. And in this collection of material the man had left were things like Bunk Johnson, who was a New Orleans trumpeter who was discovered in the 40s. So then, through hearing Collier, who'd been inspired by Bunk, I then heard Bunk Johnson myself. So well, I think that's a good enough lead into some Bunk Johnson. was from a 78 I bought in my local music shop and uh, you could buy 78s then it was towards the end of that era and so we had Bunk Johnson on trumpet but George Lewis on clarinet and a wonderful pianist called Alton Pennell both of whom I worked with later and it was a real inspiration because on these records were piano introductions so when I'm working with Alton Pennell 
about 10 years later, he did the same introduction. So it was such a thrill to think, well, I heard those records, now I'm with him. And of course, George Lewis, who was a fine clarinet player and was brought to national fame uh, by Bunk Johnson, really, because otherwise he wouldn't have left New Orleans. He eventually came to England and we saw him with Ken Collier and that was an inspiration and I found myself working with him later. But this is one of the first records I heard him on with his first band after he'd left Bunk Johnson. <laughs> That was the George Lewis Band in 1950, and what you have there is real ensemble playing, which not many people actually know how to do or do nowadays. Three voices speaking musically, and that's what thrilled me with that particular band. Well, talk, talking about ensemble playing, when did you uh, hear the first recordings, or your first recordings, of New Orleans brass bands? Well, interestingly enough, um, at the school I went to, we thought we, were, we thought we knew something about New Orleans music, us youngsters. And in the lunch hour at school, we would go down to the playing field, have school dinners, as they called them, and one day through the fence came the sound of a New Orleans brass band. Listen to a bit of this now, and I'll tell you why.
the Eureka Brass Band film uh, recorded on live on the streets in New Orleans in the early 50s. And it was such a thrill for us to hear that and get the feel of how New Orleans really was. It's raw music, but it's inspired. And uh, I'd been playing with a little band trying to play more like the Chicago jazz of the 20s, Johnny Dodds and people like that, who I loved. But when I heard this, I thought, let's try and get a brass band together. And guess what? The Melody Maker then, which had a Musicians <laughs> Wanted column, one week it said, Earth Men Wanted for New Orleans Parade <laughs> Band. But somehow we knew what the guy meant. So we all turned up under a cellar in Soho, and there were guys, and we, we tried to play this stuff, which of course is much more tricky than it sounds. So that was also another aspect of the playing we were trying to do. I had a little band that was trying to play in the New Orleans style, but also we formed a brass band, and people were in it like... Uh, Barry Godfrey, who became Barry Martin, Keith Smith, trumpeter, and various others, John Defrey. And I remember we thought we're going to try and play this. We forgot that really you're, they're marching along streets in New Orleans with the blazing sun. What did we end up doing? Marching around Soho in the snow. <laughs> but we did our best to get the sound of this music. And of course, a lot of those players that you mentioned went on to do better and greater things, didn't they? Absolutely. Yeah. So it was a kind of melting pot for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, how long had you been playing trombone by this time and what led you to the trombone? Uh, that's an interesting point. Maybe it seemed easier, which is not true at all, of course. <laughs> I mean, the piano, to my shame, I, I gave up the lessons. I think I was sort of infatuated by the glamorous piano teacher between you and me. <laughs> but uh, trombone, I just liked the way that the man with Ken Collier played it. He was a man called Mac Duncan. It was hot, which is hard to define, but you know that when you hear it. It was rhythmic, and I thought, well, maybe I can do that, you know? And so, thanks to, to working with a clarinet player I'd met at the local jazz club, formed a little group that um, was based on more 20s Chicago stuff, but still had a New Orleans feel to it. Um, and I learned the trombone through working with these guys who were as bad as I was, and we all hopefully improved. We started doing intervals at the local jazz club. But this man was a specialist in blues. He also played guitar. And, of course, blues is the heart of jazz, which I think will bring me to the next yeah, moment. It, I, I was going to ask you, how essential do you think it is for a jazz musician to understand the blues? Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, if he doesn't, he isn't a jazz musician. <laughs> it really is the heart of the music. You but there, there are a few exceptions, though. I mean, Bix, Bix wasn't... Well, that was gentle music. That, yeah. That was, yeah, difficult. He played blues in his own way, I think, Bix Beiderbeck, but this is a whole different discussion, white jazz compared to black, because there generally is a difference. And that's another interesting point we won't go into at the moment. <laughs> well, let's listen to some blues then, shall we? Yeah. yeah. I, I'll tell you what happened then. Um, I, I'll lead go, you yeah. into this. Um, we knew people like Big Bill Brunsey, who'd been to England, and various acoustic blues players, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, who I heard, who were wonderful. But suddenly, Chris Barber, with his manager Harold Pendleton, decided to bring to England Muddy Waters, who then had his own club in Chicago, wasn't really that known in England. And, uh, and I was told later by John Lewis, the pianist you may know who was with the Modern Jazz Quartet, it was Lewis, who was a very sophisticated musician, who said to Chris and Harold, you must bring Muddy to England. <laughs> he was quite proud of that. So Muddy comes to St Pancras Town Hall. <laughs> and honestly, it was electric as an experience in every sense. Let's hear a bit of his group as it would have been about that time. <laughs> Oh, 
black cat bone I got a mojo too I got the Johnny Conqueror I'm gonna mess with you I'm gonna make you girls Leave me by my hand Then the world will know That I'm a hoochie coochie man But you know I'm here seven day on the seven month the seventh doctor says he was born for good luck and that you see I got seven hundred dollars don't you mess with me but you know I'm here That was an amazing experience, hearing him, and he had a wonderful pianist, Otis Spann, with him at that time, and uh, magnetic music. Alexis Corner, who you may have heard of, was inspired by that to form a group. Now, I was playing at a place called the Ealing Club on a Friday night with a little, what I hoped was a New Orleans-style group, but Alexis Corner came in, formed something called Blues Incorporated, which launched all sorts of people which eventually melded into the Rolling Stones, but I'm not always convinced that that tradition was carried on in the way I would have liked. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and, and, and much as we loved that stuff, we wanted to play jazz. But I'll tell you another little anecdote. I was in Los Angeles some years later. We were recording some programs out there. My other interest is comedy and, and those kind of things, movie things. And we, we were working for a month there and staying in a hotel. And one night I saw Muddy Waters, the sign on Sunset Strip. I thought, I'd love to go to that. But we were so worn out after we'd tried to find people to interview every day, we went back to the hotel and flaked out, you see. <laughs> now, this is the, the punchline of the story. The last day I was in L.A. on that particular trip, we're having breakfast, and I was talking to a quite elderly comedian, not a famous one, but since he was a bit deaf, I had to speak up. And I was a bit embarrassed, and I thought, there are other people in the room. And suddenly, from over here, a figure approaches us. And I thought, oh, he's going to complain, keep it down. It was Muddy Waters, who'd been staying there all the time. <laughs> and he said, gee, you from England? I said, yeah. He said, do you know Chris Barber? I said, yeah. He said, give him my love. <laughs> so isn't that great? Because it was through Chris and people like the Stones, who always acknowledged Muddy and those people, that he had a whole new career. So I think that's wonderful. Yeah, because they, they were not earning a great deal of money, were they, in the no, States? No, they weren't. I mean, Bill Wyman told me once that they invited the marvellous performer Howling Wolf to one of their concerts. And they went to his house to pick him up. And he said, what's that all about? All about? They said, we want you on our concert. And they took him... And he didn't even have any of his own records, by the way. They took him there, and as he came in the hall, he walked down the gangway, and all the crowd was saying, the wolf, the wolf, the wolf. It was a real thrill for him. But that's thanks to a lot of these guys, like some of the Stones, Keith Richard and particularly Brian Jones, that these guys were recognised again, which I like. Yeah. And we tried to do it in a different way with some of the New Orleans people, which I'll tell you about in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you, you also got to see Louis Armstrong's All Stars, didn't you? I think in about 1959. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, because 59 was a great year for, for a lot of us youngsters. We were wannabes, you know. Um, and I had a local theatre near me called the Davis in Croydon, 2,000-seater, you know. And went along there, and 
even before the curtains parted, you felt the magnetism and the power. And then on comes Louis. Sleepy time down south was his signature to him. On they come. It wasn't quite the band that had played in England three years before. I'd been at school and for some reason couldn't go or couldn't afford to. But it was still a fine lineup with Billy Kyle on piano and one of my favourite trombonists on playing trombone, of course, Tommy Young, and Peanuts Hucko, who was really more known in the early days for being with Glenn Miller. But anyway, this was great, and so we're playing you a bit of this lineup as they were around that time. That's very different to the New Orleans style of music that you've been listening to and playing. What did you make of that? Well, I just love Louis' gift for showmanship, apart from anything else, which I think is an important part of what we do to communicate with the audience. And uh, 
there was still the same punch and drive, even though it had been polished more than the New Orleans band, because that same year we'd seen the George Lewis band, and that was more rough and ready, but really they're from the same roots. And so it's all one in the end, I think. Yeah, know. well, Louis, we didn't hear Louis singing there, but of course he was perhaps arguably the greatest jazz singer, the greatest singer perhaps uh, around. Um, yeah, were you listening it. to singers in those days and who were you listening to? Uh, well, one of my favorite albums I still got from those days is Ella and Louis, you've got them together. Two great singers, you've got Oscar Peterson. That's the way to do these songs. Of course, they now call it the American Songbook, but I always had ears for this kind of thing. As a matter of fact, the first black entertainer I saw, also at the Davis before that, was Eartha Kitt. And she wasn't a jazzer, but she had it. I worked with her years later. I didn't dare tell her I was a schoolboy when I first saw her, or she would have scratched my eyes out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the singers, yeah, it's the phrasing of the song. Louis almost invented that. And, and some good instrumentalist, I believe Lester Young, who was one of the finest, and a New Orleans man, by the way, said that you must know the lyric, then you know how to structure your solos. Indeed. And now, that's part of it. So we're going to listen to a little bit of Billie Holiday now. What, what, what were your impressions of her? <laughs> yeah, the, it's funny. I, I was playing in this band in Hastings, and we stayed with this lady who was married to another trombone player. Poor girl. And... Um, she was called Billy, but I found out it was a nickname. And I asked her why, and she put this record on, this very record, and it hit me. And I hope it hits you now. It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place Except you and me So set em up, Joe I've got a little story You all know We're drinking, my friend to the end of a brief episode Make it one for my baby And one more for the road I got the routine so drop another nickel in the machine. I'm feeling so bad. I wish you'd make the music dreamy and sad. Could tell you a lie. You've got to be true to your code Make it one for my baby And one more for the road You'd never know it but, buddy, I'm kind of a poet And I've got a lot of things to say And when I'm gloomy You simply gotta listen to me Until it's talked away Well, that's how it goes and Joe, I know you're getting anxious to close. So thanks for the cheer. I hope you didn't mind my bending your ear. The 
Miss Tots that I found must be drowned. Oh, it soon might explode. Make it one for oh, my baby and one more for the road. You never know it, but buddy, I'm kind of a poet, and I've got a lot of things to say. And when I'm gloomy, you simply gotta listen to me until it's talked away. Well, that's how it goes And Joe, I know you're getting Anxious to close So thanks for the cheer I hope you didn't mind My bending your ear This torch that I found must be drowned, or it soon might explode. Make it one for my baby, and one more for the road. music for the very early hours of the morning <laughs> but it really struck me this wonderful they talk about soul music any good music's got soul and you feel that coming through I mean she I don't think she was she was about early 40s the voice was wearing out but it was the phrasing was the thing and so that that hit me at the time well, we're going to listen to uh, a little clip from, uh, I think, around 1929 or 1930 that uh, has got two key players, the, the, the trumpeter, which I'll ask you about in a little while, but a uh, particular interest is the, uh, is, is the clarinet player because I know you did quite a few things with him. Here it is.
that was called Swing Out, and it certainly did. That was another of the records I had the luck to hear through the fence in the school dinner hour. <laughs> Just imagine what an inspiration that was. And the lovely lady who played these was listening to her son's records he'd left when he was doing national service. But this, it's the Louis Russell band, but in this case, it's under Red Allen's name, isn't it, John? Yes, yes. One of my favourite trombone players defines what it means to be hot. A lovely named Chasey Higginbottom, <laughs> probably named after a slave master or something. But the, the man you mentioned to me was Albert Nicholas, one of the great Creole clarinet players. Yeah, and where did you uh, meet up with him? <laughs> well, we, when I was working with Barry Martin, because Barry and I formed a band, which I was sort of in and out of over the years, we were on a festival in Birmingham. And uh, so I met Nick, as he liked to be called, briefly then. But it wasn't until a few years later I was exiled in Belgium and I got to know him very well there because he was living in Basel and came through to Brussels a couple of times a year and we were both playing at a, a jazz club in, in Brussels so we got to know each other quite well. Matter of fact, he came to the flat I and my then wife had and cooked a, a jambalaya. <laughs> <laughs> but he was great, a great player. And what was he like as a person? He was a proper old-fashioned gent in, in dress and manners, very smart, and uh, I'll tell you one story. So we were going to meet him off the train on one occasion, and he turned up, he had a high voice. Hey, man, how are you, man? And all that, you see. And, and we, he came to the, the main station in Brussels, and he, <coughs> and he had his clarinet clay, case and opened it up. I said, what do you think of these, man? <laughs> there were two gold-plated clarinets. He said, I went to Selma in Paris a little while ago, and they said, Mr. Nicholas, do you like these? He said, they're fine. I, I might come back and look at them one day, being an <laughs> impecunious jazz musician, even though he was one of the pioneers. They said, Mr. Nicholas, <coughs> Mr. Nicholas, they're yours. You've been a customer of ours for 50 years. Isn't that great? That's terrific, isn't it? Two gold-plated clarinets. And I, I got to know him quite well, and say he was charming and one of the what they used to call, and it's a fact, great Creole clarinet players. And most of them studied under a guy called Lorenzo Tio Jr. And he was among the main pupils, and of course he was with the Louis Russell Orchestra, which later became the Armstrong Orchestra, so he knew Louis very well. He told me once that when Ellington came to um, Basel, I suppose it was, they knew Nick lived there, so they, ph they phoned him up and said, come down as a special guest but he didn't think he'd have to play, you see. They said, oh, you're gonna play with us, Nick? Well, I haven't got my clarinet. Harry Carney will lend you his. <laughs> so he did. And Carney was mostly known for playing the bass, or sorry, the baritone sax, but Nick sat in with the band. But a wonderful man, Lovely. wonderful man. <laughs> now, we, we heard Red Allen in that, of course, and yeah. uh, you, you saw him in 59, didn't you? I did. Um, of course, Jim's the expert, because he toured with read Alan later when Alan came over by himself and guested with Alex Welsh, but I saw him, this was a great experience, at the Odeon Hammersmith, which is now the Apollo from which they transmit uh, <coughs> comedy. And this was the Odeon Hammersmith, and Louis had played there with the All-Stars. This particular year, it was the Kid Ori Band, again, 59, great year for a 17-year-old, you know. And so Ori, who was quite a small man, had hired Henry Allen to be his trumpeter <laughs> for this tour. And it was clear by seeing them from the stage front, Ori was in charge. And Henry towered over him, was a well-known showman, but Ori was the boss. <laughs> well, let's listen to a bit of this band. And, and there's, uh, this is one of my favorite recordings as well. And Henry Red gets, uh, I think it's a three chorus solo, which he starts with, uh, very, very quietly on a, with a mute. And then it just sort of builds and builds. It's uh, on I Got Rhythm.
and they had great dynamics. That's what some of us tried to learn from that experience. There was nothing ever loud. They would come right down and then back to normal and it seemed loud. That's the difference. Indeed. But I think on the concerts that you would have heard, they were playing what might be described as Dixieland racehorse music. Uh, it was a mixture of things. I think Ori was a bit of a showman himself and he would give the audience what he thought they wanted, which would sometimes take the tempo up. Yeah. I'd heard him on an air shot from Paris three years before with Alvin Alcorn, lovely player, quite different from Henry Allen, but there were fast things, but also when they did settle down, it, it, it was lovely, and, but particularly the dynamics. They were never noisy, and that's the difference between them and so many British bands. <laughs> well, Red Allen, of course, was the subject of a documentary that you did uh, later on for BBC Radio. Which, 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 which station was that? Was it two or four? It was Radio 3, because oh, three. Yeah, later on when I'd started doing quite a bit for radio, mostly to do documentaries on comedy and theatre and films, I, I thought, well, I might as well use some of the knowledge I know about jazz. And I tried, they had different slots then, documentary slots. And um, one of the series I did with David Perry, who was quite a, a visionary because he was the first chap to do a documentary on King Oliver on radio <laughs> and on Bolden. We somehow hit it off, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but the Henry Allen thing, we did that. John Chilton, the great historian, had just done a book about Henry Allen, so I said to John, if I do some programs, can I talk to you? And we pieced them together. And luckily at that time, you could have, I think it was six half hours, which Ooh. I was <laughs> delighted to have because if anyone deserved that, Henry Allen did. Be, be, the great thing about Henry Allen was that <coughs> New Orleans man, but his music was as modern as you ever want to be. Yeah, he actually, without being bebop. Without being bebop in that sense, but he'd work. I think he actually worked with Thelonious Monk, <laughs> and he fitted into everything. And, and you know, and uh, yeah. It, so we were lucky to do those programs. Uh, so how did you get into writing and broadcasting then? Well. <laughs> <laughs> When the jazz scene was sl slumping a little bit, and I also didn't like so much some of the things you were forced to do at the end of the trad boom, I thought that's not quite for me. Um, I took a different path, and I was working in the north of England with a sing-along band, which was very boring to do, but I would play jazz afterwards as a sort of antidote. <laughs> and through this, I met Max Wall. And we got on well because he'd played very good guitar and he was a, a, a jazzer himself. And through him I started doing radio things. It's really through Max. And then uh, I got known in that area. And um, working with quite a few well-known comedians, uh, um, some of which, this is the interesting thing as well, certain people you've liked from afar quite often turn out to be jazzers. Max was, Jimmy Edwards was, who I worked with, um, John LeMessurier, who played piano, actually, and was a delight <laughs> in every way. Um, so somehow things spun off in a very haphazard way. So I'll give you the Hollywood encounter, Yeah, give though. us a Hollywood encounter. <laughs> this one was almost a shock, really, though. So we're out in Hollywood, the time I was telling you of, and we interviewed a marvellous man called Carl Reiner. You may have heard the name. He wrote The Dick Van Dyke Show. And we got, we got to him. I mean... Radio is no money for those people, so quite often their agents wouldn't tell them about us wanting to talk to them. But we got to him and various other people, and our interview went quite well. And, and he said to me, are you going to see Mel? I said, I've heard. We didn't get a letter. Mel Brooks, because he'd been Mel Brooks' collaborator. They'd done these marvelous 2,000-year-old man recordings and things <laughs> like, you know, those things. And he picked up the phone and said, hey, this guy's over from London. There's Brooks on the line. I have to... And, and of course, he thinks we're all Terry Thomas. So he said, pip, pip, old bean, how long are you <laughs> over for? I said, well, old fellow, not for long. I suppose there's no chance of having a few minutes with you. He said, yeah, Fox Studios tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so we turned up there, heavy tape recorders they were then. And in the office behind his desk, is the giant blow-up of Big Spiderbeck. <laughs> I said, what's that all about? He said, oh, yeah, I used to be a drummer. So for the next five <laughs> minutes, he started playing on the glass table with his hands. <laughs> we were off. <laughs> so it was funny how these connections sometimes happen. Magic. Well, you, you also <laughs> corresponded with um, Stan Laurel, didn't you, for a while? Yeah, that was earlier. 
somehow I felt, uh, as Orson Welles might say, in the depths of my ignorance, <laughs> I thought, well, I, I must try to write to this man. You don't hear much about them. He's alive. Um, I'll send him a fan letter. And I managed to get the address. And in the end, corresponded with him for, with him for some time. So that was really a, a thrill for me, you know. And what about the connection with Bob Hope? Well, that was during the time we did the interviews in Hollywood. And um, I met his daughter, Linda. And I said, we'd hope to see Bob because we want to talk about the connection between British and American comedy. She said, well, look, I'll give you his number. He's always busy. Every year he did shows for the troops and all these kind of things, you know. Ring at 9 a.m. Make sure it's 9 a.m. So I rang. Yeah, what do you want? I said, BBC, which meant something at that time, you know. <laughs> he said, well, I'm busy with this, busy with that. I said, well, I'm here for a while. He said, well, look, phone again. I did phone again and managed to get to him. So we did a nice, a long interview. And at one point, oh, I, I tell you why it went quite well, I like to think. Because suddenly something clicked in my brain. And I said to him, I grew up quite near where you were born. He said, gee, look at the family albums. <laughs> that was Eltham in Kent, and we lived around that area at one point. And during the course of the interview, he sort of quite modestly for someone of that kind said, do you know I was the first to sing I Can't Get Started? I said, really? Yeah. And he did in a stage show. So there you are. There we are. Right. And, and you also uh, were a great fan of the goon shows, weren't you? And you, you had a bit of an involvement with... Uh, an, uh, an anniversary uh, program, didn't you? Yeah, I put together, it was 40 years of the goons then. Now I think it must be about 60, but <laughs> 40 years since they started and they asked me to compile that because my generation, we always used to listen to them at school, you know. You'd learn every line, you thought. Then you'd be in the classroom next day trying to do the wisecracks. The teacher didn't like that. So anyway, we did this documentary and Sellers had gone by then, but I interviewed Ben Tien who was a charming man. Harry Seacombe was always nice. And then came Milligan. And what about the Milligan interview? Yes, we did it. Mm, we did. <laughs> mm. And so that was an interesting experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, well, mm. you also did a, a, another interesting uh, documentary. We'll just listen to a clip of the music. to your girlfriend by kind permission of Cole Porter. You're the top. You're a German flyer. You're the top. You're machine gun fire. You're a U-boat kept with a lot of pep. You're grand. You're a German blitz. The Paris Ritz, an army band. You're the Nile. An attack by Rommel, you're the mile that I'd walk for a camel. I'm a Soviet chick, a total wreck, a flop. But it's baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. You're the top, you're Mahatma Gandhi, you're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy. You're a German race by Messer Schmidt at night. You're the Stuka noise, Goering boys, you're Nazi mice. You're Swiss cheese. You're a bottle of whiskey. You're strip cheese. That is rather risky. I'm completely not like General Smuts of Fluff. But if baby, I'm the bottom. You're the Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of these, this aggregation, but this was an orchestra 
assembled in Germany um, to broadcast propaganda against the Allies. And they palmed themselves off as Allies because they had a, a chap singing in English, and you heard an example of that. They'd rewrite the lyrics. The bit you didn't hear was, you're the tops, you're a Nazi flyer, you're the tops, you're machine gun fire. I mean, subtle stuff, you know. And by accident, I found some of these recordings in the BBC archives, and they tried to release some a few years earlier, and they'd been immediately withdrawn in the fatherland. <laughs> and I was intrigued by that story. So thanks again to John Chilton, whom I mentioned earlier, he knew a drummer working in Munich then who'd been in that very band, Charlie and his orchestra. And it was actually a band run by a man called Lutz Templin, and the singer was a chap called Karl Schwedler, and someone wrote out these lyrics. There are many which are much nastier, and they're anti-Semitic and really serious things. And thanks to David Perry, who I mentioned earlier, we did a program about it. And at that time, which is now just about 30 years ago, it got more calls from listeners than anything had for the previous month. Other people have used this material since, but we were the first to bring it to light. And don't forget that in Germany at the time, thanks to Dr. Goebbels, jazz was Neger music, and you weren't actually supposed to listen to it or play it in Germany. But they assembled various musicians, including a very good Italian trumpeter, people from, it, from uh, Holland, and this drummer, who was called Freddy Brock Sieper, we went to his home in Munich, and he said, yeah, I'm the Jim Cooper of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course we said to him, what was it like doing that stuff? And he said, well, if I hadn't played it, I would have been sent to the Eastern Front. Mm. What would you do is the question. I yeah. got a letter in from a listener asking me, and of course it's quite a question. But some of these records, apparently the 78s were released <laughs> by parachute and dropped <laughs> behind the enemy lines. <laughs> and uh, I met this retired producer who'd actually found some in a deserted um, Nazi radio station in Crete. So anyway, we assembled some of these and uh, there was the program, the first <laughs> one, and of course, I forgot this bit. We had to call it swing time for Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the 60s, you worked with quite a few of the American uh, veterans from New Orleans. Tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about that. Yeah, I was awfully lucky because Barry Martin went out to New Orleans, met a lot of these black musicians when you couldn't really mix with them, and managed to get the money to bring some of them over to guest with his band. And I, was, I often played with him then because his regular guy wasn't available, so I didn't argue. Would I tour with George Lewis, for example, Alton Pennell, uh, a, a lovely guy called, called uh, Harold Dejan, saxophone player? But uh, among all these guys, the one who stood out in a, a different way... Oh, Kid Thomas Valentine was a real character and a half as well. Um, there are stories that abound about him, but the man who, rather like Henry Allen, <coughs> his playing could embrace all styles, and he'd been hidden away because certain people think a saxophone shouldn't be played in New Orleans jazz. He'd played some clarinet, but his saxophone playing, well, my good friend Dave Green, fine bass player, he did a recording with him, and, and I saw him the other day because I'm doing a compilation of Handy for the Upbeat label. And um, he compared him to people like Coltrane, uh, sorry, not Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, Eddie Cleanhead Vinson. And he had, and again, he was full of blues. When we toured with him, I don't remember him saying a word, but the music welled out of him. It was raw, he had a touch of Louis Jordan, and... Uh, this, he was known as Cap'n John Handy, Captain, because there was a modern sax player called John Handy mm. as well. And I don't think anyone swung more than him that I've had the luck to play with, so I'm not on this record, but play a bit of Handy and let's get a sample of him.
this man was a force of nature, an amazing player. I did a brass band recording with him, and although brass band music is a bit more disciplined, he was wild, and I said <laughs> to Barry, let him go, and bang. And this is a recording he did in, in about 65, and Sammy Remington, who'd just gone to America, was sitting next to him and based the rest of his career on this. <laughs> <laughs> and the kid Thomas was playing trumpet there. He had a rather bleating approach, I'll put it that way, <laughs> but he didn't half swing. And this is the raw music of, of the city. Well, we're, we're going to go a little bit more sophisticated now because you and I worked together in the 80s with Wild Bill Davison and Art Hodes. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your recollections of that. Oh. That was a great bit of luck, and thanks to you, I'd always admired Wild Bill Davison. Now, we were talking, I was, earlier about black and white jazz, and guess what? Wild Bill encapsulated the best of it all. Uh, his idol, I think, was Louis, and somehow his music spanned it all. And um, uh, when we met, <laughs> we met him in Belfast, and I knew that, a lot of these Americans, they're much smarter than we Brits. I mean, none of this sloppy stuff. A jacket, a tie, and all <laughs> this, you see. So I thought, I'll try and be smart. I turned up with a tie and everything. Clarinet player didn't. And Bill looked at me and said, how are you? I said, fine. Clarinet player, where's your tie? <laughs> thought we could be in trouble. So we travelled round Belfast, got, tried to get a tie for this guy. But he was picky. This is Dave Bailey. Yeah. So... I said to Bill's wife, Annie, who was a lovely lady, I know Bill must travel with quite a few ties because he showed me his earlier with the small letters D-O-M and he was proud because it meant doity old man, you see. <laughs> he was just like an Al Capone character, wasn't he? Yes. So we borrowed a couple of his ties. I had the D-O-M tie on stage. Dave had another of them. In the middle of the concert, I paused and said to Bill, what do you think of them? What did he say? <laughs> I can't remember. I'm working oh. with a gang of criminals. <laughs> yeah. But what a player. And it was a privilege. And Art Hodes was a great blues player, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. But this album is one I treasured before. And although Bill was part of the rather umbustious Eddie Condon mob, someone had the idea of his style, which had a rough edge to it, tough tender, as my old friend George Melly would say. So they had the idea of recording him with strings, and that doesn't always work, but here's an example I think is wonderful.
Wild Bill with strings, and quite, quite an experience, wasn't it, with Bill? Wonderful. What a privilege. Yeah. Now, um, you had a, a, a great working relationship and friendship with the late George Melly, and um, you, you did a couple of documentaries. Did Melly on Jelly, I think? That was yeah. uh, the first one. Then we did one going up the river from New Orleans to Chicago. Yeah. One in Harlem, various other things, but the most moving, which started with the going up the river business, was we did a series on Bessie Smith. Now, what happened during that documentary that you were, you were doing? Well, we wanted a, a section on blues in this one to do with New Orleans, and we thought, well, we'd go to um, Mississippi and see what we could find, various survivors, and we went to a chap called, I can't think of his other name, Townsend, who'd known Robert Johnson, so that was a great connection. Mm. Henry Townsend, old guy, you know. And we, were, we, we found out there was a blues museum in Oxford, Mississippi, William Faulkner country, so we went there. Then I realised we were only miles up the road from Clarksdale, where the great Bessie Smith had died in an awful car crash. So we thought, let's go there and pay an homage to Bessie, who'd been George's idol all those years. And, and we found this place that was called... I think it was called Riverside Hotel, and it said, Home of the Delta Blues. It was almost a shack, and it had been rather like what we called cottage hospitals. It was like that sort of place. And as we stood across the road, I said to George, just say a bit about what Bessie means to you. And just as we started with the tape recorder, someone beckoned us in. Hmm. So we went over, there's a black guy there. He said, oh yeah, my mama bought this place during the war. And uh, we had a cup of tea with him. We, we thought, just nice to be there. He said, gee. And Bessie Smith, everyone thought at the time, 1937, that Bessie had been um, turned down from a white hospital. But the fact is, you'd never have thought of taking a black person to a white hospital. And from where she had the car crash, which tore her arm off virtually, um, it was equidistant to a black one, but she got there too late. And this was the place that had been that hospital. And he said, gee, do you want to see the room where old Bessie died? And of course, we froze. Okay. Next room, tiny room with a great big color blow up of Bessie Smith on the bed. So we were nearly all in tears. George particularly was. So let's just hear this wonderful voice again, because there's no one like her. <laughs> Carry on 
Wow. <laughs> great. Charlie Green, trombone. Great accompanist. And uh, that's that wonderful voice lives today. Incredible stuff. Well, mm. one of the documentaries, I think one of the ones that you, you were most proud of, was uh, one you did on Benny Carter. Tell us a little bit, bit about that. Yes, I was, all, I was awfully lucky with that. Um, I suddenly realized that Benny Carter was still alive, living in Hollywood, and he'd been one of the few, one of the first black musicians to work regularly there and become a, an arranger and got respected by the whole community. And a friend of mine was a neighbor of his. I said, can you ask him if he'd do something for the BBC? So she found out that they actually both played tennis at the same tennis club. <laughs> So somehow she talked him into doing this. We went over and interviewed him for a day, and he was a delight, proper gentleman. He'd been a composer and arranger, of course, all his life, multi-instrumentalist. And I can see his study now, full of pictures of presidents he'd met and, and certificates and God knows what. And of course, I think he had a soft spot for the BBC as they used to be, because in the 30s, briefly, he was a house arranger and arranged for Henry Hall, who I also met at one point, another charming man. But so we were awfully lucky to, to do that because he was 95 at the time and we just caught him in time. So that's one of the things I'm proudest of having had the chance to do. Well, let's listen to a bit of Benny Carter then from, uh, from his golden age in the 30s. When Lights Are Low, one of his compositions, great stuff. Well, sadly, time has got the better of us, Mike. Um, but before we just to conclude, what, what, do you, what do you think about the future? Where's, where's jazz going? And uh, what about broadcasting jazz? Where's that going? Well, I think we're all an endangered species. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, um, jazz as we know it, as we know it, I, I don't think gets the coverage it should get. 
one or two people do it, like Walter Love in BBC Radio Ulster, and uh, it's a niche music in many ways. If only ch the young people had the chance to hear it. I mean, if you were in Germany or other places, they do still give coverage, I believe, to different styles of music. But here, you've got to search for jazz, but luckily there are young people like Simon today who searched for it and found it. So that's the hope for the future, I'd say. Broadcasting is another matter because certainly the sort of documentaries I've done, there don't, there don't seem to be any of those nowadays. Alan Shipton does a great job on jazz record requests because he respects all the styles, but really, it's, it's a bit sad. I'll give you an example. BBC Radio London the other week. There's quite a good exhibition at the moment called Rhythm and Reaction <laughs> in the place, <laughs> in Temple Place, with lots of things to do with art from the jazz age as it hit Britain. Okay, I've been to it, and they've got old drum kits there, a bit like yours, and other <laughs> bits and pieces. And <laughs> No, older than yours. Older than mine. But they did a broadcast of BBC Radio London, and guess what the woman on it said? Thank you. Lovely to hear Duke Wellington. Oh, and that's yeah. what we're up against, you see. We're almost written out of history. Some of the magazines ignore what I think we can safely say we like. And it's, I think there's a kind of discrimination, I hate to say it, and uh, we just have to fight against that and hope that young people like Simon and Adrian Cox and Jack, other good course. people, yeah. Jack yeah. here, and the young ones, and they're the ones doing it, like Spats Langham does, yeah. spreading the gospel and... But the only guy who's teaching this music in the more orchestrated way is Keith Nichols, who mm. still pulls kids together to play the classic jazz uh, at the Royal Academy of Music. Whether they play it after that, I've no idea, but um, <laughs> let's hope it survives. Certainly the records will, the rest we'll have to see. Lovely. Mike Point, thank you very much. Mike Point and Lady Shepherd.